Hello everyone and welcome to a new episode of The Surge. My name is Saud al Zaid. So for today's episode, I'd like to talk about the logistics of Venus Access, uh, review some of the options, uh, talk about what to use, when to use it, at least uh, in the centers that I've been in. There's always been some sort of a debate, and I find that a consistent strategy, A, helps people stay on board, B, stops people from panicking, and C, makes it easier to teach in these types of situations. And let's face it, for the most part, most of us work in an academic setting, and while patient care takes priority, a secondary, a very close second, is uh, how well you teach under these situations, because eventually somebody's going to be taking care of you uh, during one of these dire situations. And statistically speaking, we'll probably all end up in the ICU at one point or another. Um, what's your optimal setup and how to maximize flow rates? Also, how long to keep them in? When to downgrade, which is always challenging and I find is one of the aspects of venous access that we tend to neglect. And how to teach uh, technique and keep it uh, a priority in people's heads. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is the concept of luminal thinking, or what I call luminal thinking. And that's when y you realize that it's not about one single access line. It's about setting up your resuscitation using the number of lines that you have. Uh, we all work in multidisciplinary institutions, or many of us do. And uh, with that in mind, a lot of the decision-making processes involve theoretical risks that may not be clearly apparent during resuscitation. I'm trying to make this sound very politically correct. What I'm really trying to say is people are always afraid about mixing drugs together and mixing pressors and blood products and Ringer's lactate and God knows what else. The reality is it doesn't really matter if you mix them during a resuscitation situation, but still it's poor form. And so therefore, whenever I think about a resuscitation, in my mind, I need five lumens, not just one. The first access that I'll put in is the one that I'm going to be giving fluids through and bolus through. And usually that's either a peripheral IV or an intraosseous line, uh, depending on what the blood pressure is like and what the venous return is like. I also have a single lumen allocated to non-pressor drugs, such as antibiotics, transexemic acid, withdrawing uh, blood tests and lights. I have a lumen specifically for sedation and paralysis, and I have one lumen for active resuscitation drugs, such as pressors, ionotropes. Sometimes I have a runner uh, connected up uh, during patient transport. And so when you count all of those lumens in, I need a minimum of five lumens, which means two peripheral lines or intraosseous lines, plus one form of central access. Now, Although I see a lot of people rush to put in central lines, as you'll see a little bit later on, they're not the optimal resuscitation line for fluid boluses. Uh, they're great for giving drugs, but they're not great for, for giving boluses or things like that. The flow rates are just suboptimal, and, and it doesn't really work in a dire situation, at least in my experience. So your average triple lumen central line, in my, in my eyes at least, is good for taking bloods during a resuscitation situation and for giving drugs but it's not necessarily designed for maximized flow rates. And uh, although you can get some sort of customized job like this going, the flow rates through it would be suboptimal, and the damn thing looks a little bit ugly. I mean, look at it. It looks like an alien, a nine-port Venus access line. My God. The reality is that whenever you're dealing with patients that require advanced resuscitation using advanced Venus access strategies, you really have only three types. The first type is a might need situation. And in those cases, I tend to go with two peripheral IVs while the patient's stable, and maybe a triple lumen if I start giving blood or I start giving a bolus. So you're sort of funny looking pancreatitis patient that's landed in the ICU for quote unquote observation, suddenly requires another four liters of fluid. Those are the types of patients where I'm putting in a second vein, uh, peripheral IV and I'm probably going to put in a triple lumen or a cordis. And we'll talk about those options a little bit later. But um, depending on where you work and the setting that you're in, your gold standard should be a cordis introducer uh, for a dynamic resuscitation, at least in my eyes, or a MAC line as opposed to a triple lumen. As mentioned prior, triple lumens are great for giving drugs and measuring CVPs not so good for anything else really then there's the cases where you know that they're going to need it so you know that they're eventually going to need blood products they're eventually going to need pressors they're eventually going to need these things so these are patients like uh, upper gi bleeds that are going for a scope or uh, patients who are going for an angiography 
or perioperative cardiac patients. They will all invariably need some sort of central access and an arterial line. And the fact of the matter is, the earlier that you get them in, the better it is for everybody. And your anesthetist will probably appreciate it too. I mean, uh, the fact of the matter is, these patients are usually sick from the get-go, and having a triple lumen in place with two peripheral IVs, it's the right thing to do. Um, the last category is the crash and burn, or the crash landing. And that's when you barely have a blood pressure. In those patients, I go straight to intraosseous lines. So if my systolic is below 60, I know for a fact that the venous return won't support finding quote-unquote easy veins. And uh, depending on the expertise of the nursing staff involved, I either give them two tries to try to get a peripheral line in, or I just go straight with double IOs. And as I'll show you later, double IOs have been reported on the same limb. It's not that big a deal to have two IOs on the same humerus. And in fact, the uh, flow rates will be optimized. The only problem that you have is setting up your IO. And I find that many people don't flush it enough and don't go th through the requisite training or don't know the size of the needle that they're supposed to use. Just far too many people in the resuscitation room tend to not use the big enough needle, tend to not drill it in enough, and then tend to not flush it enough for it to be optimal. And that's why you end up with problems with intraosseous lines. The literature supports their use, as you'll see a little bit later, and uh, they're very easy to do once you're trained in them. Once the IOs are in, I start my resuscitation, and that gives me enough time to set up for a quote-unquote elective central line and a MAC line. And those are my definitive IV accesses, because remember, an intraosseous should never stay for more than three days. Most case reports and most recommendations say 24 hours. The pamphlet that it comes with says 24 to 48 hours, but at least the easy IOs, but in my eyes, no more than 72 hours is the reality of things. Also, the site of your central access, uh, if you're going to be going for central access, makes a huge difference. And it depends on how comfortable you are with doing blind central lines. So in our institute, we do subclavians blindly uh, for trauma patients and patients in the resuscitation room because it's just quicker. And uh, what I do is I put in Two, two neck stabs, two guide wires in, and then I dilate over them. But I establish two uh, guide wires in place prior to that. I either put one cordis or a MAC line, which I'll show you later, or a subclavian, triple lumen, and a MAC line as well. And that gives me all my five ports that I need for my resuscitation. If I'm not so comfortable with the central line, I have two intraosei in place, start the resuscitation, and then I either go for an ultrasound guided IJ or a blind femoral. Again, this depends on your institution, your level of comfort, and who you're training. And for the most part, it depends on how you set yourself up initially. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, but a lot of it has to do with preparedness prior to anything else. Just like with the uh, intubation episode, the more prepared you are prior to the event, the easier things will be and the less chaotic they will be. So what is the best line, quote unquote? Very hard to tell, very hard to know. If you're looking for infection complication rates, the best lines are probably the peripheral IVs followed by the intra OCI. And then for flow, I'd go with a cordis or a RIC line. Most institutes I've worked in have cordis introducers, and, they, and some of them even have peripheral, sort of peripheral dilated lines called RIC lines. And the flow rates through them are phenomenal. Whenever I can get it, and it's very, very rare, it's usually in ivory tower institutions, mainly in the States, I try and get a MAC line, and this is what a MAC line looks like. It's basically a cordis, with a nine French uh, catheter up top that merges with the rest of the line somewhere around the bridge, and it's phenomenal. It is something out of this world. Um, the reason why I'm a big fan of IOs is because A, literature supports it, B, we're very good at putting them in, especially in an era where, when it's compared with ultrasound-guided central lines, they're just quicker especially the EZIO system, which is probably the most validated in uh, North America at this point. And C, they've been tested in many settings. You can use them out of hospital, and that's been proven to influence patient outcome. You can use them during cardiac arrests in hospital, and that's influenced patient outcome, and can be used during air transport even, and it's provided optimal outcome when compared to uh, central lines in uh, inaccessible peripheral veins. What about maximizing flow so in my eyes whenever you maximize flow you really have to look at your setup so there's a couple of things that influence how much you can pump through an IV system uh, 
If you read Guyton and you read your basic physiology, your mean systemic filling pressure, your central venous pressure, and your preload uh, optimization, or lack thereof, are all factors that influence how quickly you can get stuff into veins in terms of the back pressure concept. The size of your cannula and the uh, gauge of your cannula is another factor that factors in. So the bigger the, the circumference and the shorter the cannula, the better in terms of flow rates. But the third most influential thing is whether or not you have a pressure bag involved and whether or not you have a needleless connector or a bung as they call it in Europe. And that makes a huge, huge, huge difference. Um, if you look at the, uh, the use of a bung and a bung with a pressure bag on this graph um, from uh, in vitro studies, it's a huge difference in terms of rates of flow. So to optimize flow, make sure you have the shortest extension on the shortest line with the biggest circumference with a pressure bag involved. And that will turn your 22 gauge into something like a 14 gauge. And it will turn your your um, cordis introducer into something phenomenally fast. You can run up to half a liter a minute <coughs> using a cordis introducer under pressure. And I remember uh, there was an MCRIT episode about the logistics of blood products where they discussed whether or not a cordis introducer is more distensible under pressure. And this graph basically proves it. It is more distensible when compared to a 14 gauge under pressure, as you can see. So the flow rates through these intravascular devices, be it your RIC line or your cordis introducer set then pictured here, it's, it's very variable and it's not as advertised. And um, as you can see here, it's about 20 to 30 percent less than whatever is advertised. And I think that a lot of it has to do with the variability in terms of setup. The advertised manufacturer quoted flow rates are usually ones that are done under simulation studies first and then optimized in real world ex vivo studies. They're never really done in vivo. They don't factor in things like back pressure on the veins, preload optimization, mean systemic filling pressures, how under resuscitated a patient is, or uh, how long your extension tubing is. And all of these factors factor into place. I use the bare minimum amount of extension with the smallest filter I can. The nurses hate it, especially when we're giving blood products. I also tend to use a runner with my blood products, a little bit of crystalloid just to lower the viscosity a little bit. And I try to give two units at a time or two liters at a time as a bolus through a level one transfuser that's warmed. All of these things put into play, I end up getting about 250 cc's ish to up to a liter. So about a unit of blood a minute, more or less, going through the patient's system, if not a little bit more. Uh, again, I'm not the best resuscitationist in the world. I'd never say that. I'm very early in my career. But I find that these small details make a huge difference. And in our center, because I tend to reinforce these things because I have no life, we've become very, very good at that. And we've become very, very good at not relying on the central venous line, which, as you can see, has a flow rate of about uh, 84 cc's a minute under pressure compared to a, a EIC, which is a cordis introducer set with a flow rate of 228 cc's a minute of plasma light. I mean, the, the, the difference is so big that there's no question in my eyes that the ultimate line is a cordis or a MAC introducer line. Uh, again, the effects of external pressure and kinetic energy not only affect how well patients do in terms of flow rates, but also affect your probability of, of ruining or blowing the IV. And uh, as you can see from this little study um, done on uh, rabbit models, uh, the smaller the IV cannula is, the more likely you are to injure the endothelium, uh, especially when giving boluses under pressure. The bigger the IV cannula is, the more protective it is, and so the less likely you are to actually damage the endothelium. Now, a 16 gauge on a rabbit is pretty much the same as a cordis on a human being. So with a cordis, you're getting the best of both worlds. You're protecting the inside of the veins, or a RIC line even, you're protecting the inside of the veins, and at the same time, uh, you're giving a fairly uh, optimized uh, flow rate, and uh, you have um, uh, less turbulence in terms of flow because of the actual size of the lumen itself. Plus, the coating of the cordis introducer sets is, is more smooth, I find, uh, than your generic central line. And I think that that plays a role, too, although I can never really prove it. And um, this is just to prove uh, that you can have two uh, 
intra-Asia in the same humerus. Um, it, it sounds very intuitive, but people very rarely think about it. I remember the first time I did it, uh, it was like people are seeing an alien. Um, but thank God that there's some literature that supports it at this point. They work beautifully. You just have to make sure that you flush them enough. That's all. And most people don't. I'm talking about like 10 cc's of NS with xylo. How long should lines stay in? So, good question. I've yet to see a good study on resuscitation lines and when it's safe to take them out. Um, I have a non-evidence-based approach to this. In my eyes, if you spent 24 hours with a good blood gas off of pressors with no blood products being given and no ex ex uh, no fluids about maintenance being given, the lines need to come out. Remember, lines can save lives, but they can also kill people. Nosocomial infections are rampant now in 2017 in our ICUs, and it's just not uh, optimal for lines to stay in for too long. And like with everything in resuscitation, it's all about timing and having an established policy for it. The more you plan for these things, the easier it is for your team to work on them. What about training? So in our institution, um, I've sort of championed the use of intra OCI. Um, we're sort of getting better and better at it, even though I've only been here for a couple of months. People are starting to talk about it a little bit more, and whenever they are available, we're using them a lot more, and, and that's made a huge difference to our resuscitation times and logistics. I tend to try and give it an in-service wherever I am every three months. I put up posters all over the place, uh, usually printed in color so that people know what needles to use where. I like to establish IOs before I start teaching how to put in a central line during a resuscitation. It just makes everybody in the room more comfortable. And uh, I do a dry run before your first patient gets there. Usually after morning report, I take everybody downstairs and we set up something that looks like this with a medical student acting like the patient on the stretcher, one person acting as the RT, the airway person or commander being in place, and the nurse. I also have the line person uh, stand at the site where they're going to be putting in the line with the ultrasound on the opposite end to them. And I stand at the end of the bed uh, just watching everybody and making sure that nobody messes up. And we go through a dry run of this once or twice, three times. And the reason why I like this setup and I like putting in lines from the side is because you can use the same person to do your fast or rush ultrasound to try and figure out whether or not somebody requires any, adva any other advanced maneuvers and try and figure out why they're so unstable and require all this maintenance. Um, another thing that I learned recently is that you can use chicken to teach people how to put central lines in. And, and according to this study, at least, it works great. And if these images are to be believed, and I actually tried this a couple of days back, it works. Uh, I'm not going to lie. It looks like a central line, and it makes it easy to learn the maneuvers. The only thing is your guide wire won't go very far. So it's great for learning how to stick, but it's probably not the best way to learn how to uh, use the kit itself and sometimes just that confidence of learning how to use a kit just takes a while So in conclusion um, Minimize the number of gaps in your resuscitation lines make sure that you have more than that just one lumen uh, In my humble opinion it might, might be overkill, but in my eyes you need five lumens at least um, Make sure that you familiarize yourself with the equipment that's available to you in your hospital Regularly do in-services discussing these strategies that you're going to be using so that everybody's on the same page. And try and get intra-OCI in your hospital. Uh, increasingly, you will see that that will be the go-to for resuscitation, especially now that we know that we can put two of them in on the same limb. For me, that's changed everything. And be cognizant of when you, you decannulate your patients and start getting rid of lines early because nosocomial infections are rampant. And learn how to teach it uh, in a safe manner. And that's basically a take-home message for today. And try not to reinvent the wheel. I mean, yes, in some settings, it might be a good idea to try and use the penile corpora to give somebody epi. But in the real world, we don't even do saphenous cutdowns anymore. That's gone the way of the dinosaur. So learn how to use something that's practical like an intra osseous rather than trying to read up on something fancy. The more fancy things are, the more mixed up they are, the less predictable they are, and the more uncomfortable your team will be. At least that's my, been my experience. Um, this is Saud Alzade signing off. Thank you for listening.